think that's probably a really good idea, Andy. Okay. Okay, good good afternoon, everyone, and uh, a very warm welcome to, to this PetraSkills webinar. I'm Andy Gibbons. Um, some of you on the call may have, have met me previously. I'm your, your contact point, your account manager for, for PDO, and I'm acting as your, your producer today. This is, is one of our PetraSkills webinars that we're running as part of a series at the moment that we call Tech Tuesday. And we have a number of different webinars on, on many different technical subjects related to, to oil and gas. And if you go to our website, which is www.petraskills.com, you can see details of both the future webinars and also recordings of ones that we've already completed. If there's something that's of interest to you and you, you've missed that. We're also for, for PDO doing a second webinar on, on Wednesday. You'll have the, the pleasure or the misfortune to hear me present on international best practice in process safety management. And that is at the same time on Wednesday. So Wednesday, 2 p.m. Oman time. So before I hand over to, to Ron to introduce himself and to, to present the webinar, I just wanted to point out a couple of things to you. First of all, your, your microphones are on mute. We, we do that on purpose from experience with this kind of webinar because background noise can, can affect the quality of the sound and can make it more difficult for, for people to hear. So we have muted the, the microphones on entry. We will have a time for a Q&A at the session. And to be able to send any questions to us, you'll see on your webinar, on your WebEx control panel, you have a chat box. And you can select who you send it to. You can send it to all participants. You can send it to all panelists. You can send it to, to just Ron. But because I will be fielding the questions and asking them at the end of the session, then please just don't send them to just, just Ron, otherwise I'll miss them. So send them to all or send them to all panelists. That would be uh, absolutely great. You've got a few other controls. Um, you can put your hand up. So there is a, a hand on the bottom left controller of the participant box. If we were doing questions and answers, there are a tick and a cross. We won't be using those today. There are also some <coughs> Uh, emojis that we would use in a training session, which can be go slower or go faster to flag to the presenter that we need to speed up or slow down. They don't really matter for a, um, a one hour webinar. And you've also got some, some smiley emojis, etc. that please feel free to, to use if you wish. So um, that's really all I've, I've got to say. And uh, Ron, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Okay, Andy, thank you very much. Uh, it might be an idea to start some dialogue with some of the attendees. I've noticed uh, Zainab um, couldn't hear, uh, but I'll leave that with you, Andy. <coughs> In the meantime, let's get started on this webinar. Uh, we are recording this webinar, so um, you will be able to download the recording later and possibly share that with your colleagues. Okay, right now, the idea is we're going to be talking about asset integrity of static plant. So we're going to be talking about um, pressure vessels, we're going to be talking about separators, uh, we'll be talking about tanks, piping, and so on. And the intention is we want to make sure that our equipment is in good enough state, good enough condition, that we do not get a loss of containment that could lead to a possible fire or an explosion. Okay. All right. First of all, the legal bit. Uh, legal departments insisting that we say this first. Uh, the information that we are talking about is generic. And when we actually developed this, this was for public consumption. So this covers um, upstream, midstream, even downstream. And so we're not guaranteeing anything. Uh, we're trying to to help you, but sorry guys, no guarantees. 
um, and <laughs> we're refusing any liability. But that's that's just the legal bit. Um, as Andy said, there is a, a participant list and there is a chat window. Now you should be able to identify this if you go to the top of your screen. You will see one thing that will be there. That will be the participants in the chat. It might not look quite like this, but you should see a, a pull down for a participant screen in a chat window. If you pull down the participant list, you should get a list something like this. Uh, the main thing is you will get a picture. You should be able to see me. And this is me waving hi. Um, Andy Gibbons is also there. there. And these are the buttons that Andy was talking about on the bottom. So as Andy said, please feel free. On the chat window, where it says send to host, presenter, and panelists, please, this is where I'd ask you to put your questions. And Andy will collate and gather those questions, and we'll go through them at the end of the webinar. So who's this guy on the other end of your TV screen? Uh, my name is Ron, Ron Friend. Um, I've been around for quite a while. I started my working life in 1970. So even though it says 40 years experience, it's actually a bit longer than that now. Um, I started my working life as a marine engineer with Shell Tankers. So I am a Shell person. I was with Shell Tankers from 1970 through 1984. And in 1984, Shell sent me to, guess where? Oman. And I joined PDO as a mechanical supervisor in Fahud in 1984. I quickly became section head, and I ended up being head of technical support covering all of North Oman. Uh, I left PDO in 89. I set up my own consultancy. And I've been working around the world. I worked in every continent apart from Antarctica. Uh, as far as I know, there's still not a lot of demand for oil and gas in Antarctica. I joined John M. Campbell as, as a speaker, as a trainer in 2011. I became discipline manager, and then I became head of facilities training in 2016. So if there's anything you don't like about PetroSkills training, I'm sorry guys, but the book stops here. So if you don't like anything or you've got suggestions for improvement, please let me know. My email is just ron.friend at petroskills.com. Okay. And it's really nice to be back in PDO. <laughs> okay, so what we're doing in this webinar, <clears throat> it's only one hour long. We can't do too much. But what we can do is look at some of the big issues with integrity of static plant. And the biggest thing that we worry about is how on earth can I make sure that I do not have a loss of containment? Because the product that we have inside our static plant, it's a hydrocarbon, it's got lots and lots of chemical energy. We're also finding lately we're having more H2S. So a loss of containment is dangerous. On top of that, not only is it a a dangerous environment in which we, we have to work. If you do have a loss of containment, then there's a big financial impact on the company too. So on the one side, we want to be safe. We want to be able to go home to our families at the end of the day. And we also want to make sure that the company still makes money. We don't want a loss of containment. Big, big problem. The issues that we've got is that there are many ways in which we can lose containment in this industry. So what we're gonna try and do is we're gonna try and look at some of the issues associated with that loss of containment. So we're talking about corrosion issues, um, mechanical damage issues, and so on. Then what we'll do, we'll say, well, if I know what the damage mechanism is, how can I detect it before it actually becomes a loss of containment? And that is also problematic. Now, once we do decide on what the inspection techniques are, what the detection methods are, what I'll then do is say, well, how can I manage this? So now what we're gonna do is, we're, gonna, we're not gonna go right into a full asset integrity program, but what we are gonna do is talk about one aspect of that, which is an 
an inspection program, an inspection plan. So what can we do to prevent fires and explosions in oil and gas facilities? Well, the first thing is understand what can go wrong. If you don't know what can go wrong, you're guessing. Now, many years ago, when I ran the inspection program in North Oman, when we did our inspections, our inspections were pretty much based on what people considered we needed. There was a little bit of input from the DEPs, but it really was not a lot. What it was left to was the individual discretion of the inspectors. Things are now different. We know a lot more about damage mechanisms now than we did 30, 40 years ago. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at some of the damage mechanisms. Now what we've done to make life easier for this webinar, we've split the damage mechanisms into four main groups. One of them is wall thinning and pitting, mainly corrosion. Then we've got stress-driven damage, cracking and fracture. Then we've got physical deformation. The last one, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on because this is more of a refining issue, metallurgical environmental issues. But we'll go through these one at a time. The one I mentioned first was wall thinning and pitting. And what we've identified is there are four main issues here, four main subgroups. The one at the top, chemical and galvanic corrosion. Um, if we're talking about galvanic corrosion, the classic way of looking at galvanic corrosion is two dissimilar metals. But two dissimilar metals is not the only way you get galvanic corrosion. You have microcells building up in the material. So what we can do is we can have variations in hardness, we can have variations in chemistry in the steel, and when that happens, then we get very small changes in the way in which we have uh, slight voltages within the steel. If we have slight differences in voltage in local areas within the steel, those slight differences in voltage can result in a current flowing. So if we now have something else in here, something which acts as an electrolyte, to complete the circuit, what we now have is electron migration. If we have electron migration going from one area to another, that means we are leaving ions of the material, usually ions of steel, ions of iron. They are now left in that area, and because they are now ionic, they are now much more susceptible to corrosion issues, particularly if there's any oxygen. Now, you guys will probably see this mostly on buried pipelines. I don't expect to see a lot of galvanic action in pressure vessels and probably not even in tanks. But the external surface of pipelines, if it rains, the rain now goes into the sand. The sand is somewhat salty. It makes a perfect electrolyte. So now what we've got is this electrical circuit, and what you end up is it's pitting. So you have to figure out a way of actually, first of all, identifying that and then protecting it. There are other issues there. It's not just galvanic corrosion. We also have issues here with um, chemical attack. That could be a change in the process. So things have changed in the reservoirs over the years. And certainly in the early 80s in the Fahud area, we did not have any H2S. We didn't have to worry about H2S attack, but it's now something of an issue. So things do change. And then we've got to consider, are our materials going to be acceptable for these new changes? You might have corrosion under insulation. If you've got corrosion under insulation, now you've got a big, big problem. It's not so much of an issue in Oman, although it is, it is a problem, but it's mainly those areas where there's a lot of rainwater. Uh, Europe has a big issue, uh, North America has a big issue, Far East also has a big issue. But anywhere where water can be trapped can be a problem. If you've got cryogenic plant, that can also be an issue because in normal operation, it's not too bad. 
but during the cool down and the warm up, then we can have liquid water or liquid condensation inside the insulation. Big problem. Um, you could have a problem with your inhibitors. Has your operator changed? Does your new operator know how to inject the inhibitor correctly? Um, you could have dealloying, degraphitization. Erosion is also a problem. Um, high fluid velocities, particularly. If you've got a high fluid velocity, particularly if you've got contamination and a lot of turbulence, then that high velocities will scour away on the inside, usually of the pipe, but I've also seen it inside separators. Can be a problem. Um, I mentioned there about cavitation. Uh, we did have an issue years ago when I was in Fahud, when we had a failure of a flow line in the Fahud area. Uh, what actually happened is uh, a local guide came in and said we killed his camel. And I went out to have a look at it, and sure enough, there was a big leak, and it was contaminated uh, fluid. There was a, a high water content in the oil, and the camel came along, drank the water, and it, the camel died. It turned out that, we, first of all, we thought it was erosion, but it actually turned out this is a very low-producing well with a lot of sand. And what had happened was the sand had collected in a low point in the flow line, which had restricted the flow path through the flow line. The, the liquid's now accelerating through that area. That acceleration caused a drop in pressure. The drop in pressure meant the pressure dropped below the vapor pressure. We had vapor bubbles forming. Once the vapor bubbles went past the obstruction area, the liquid slowed down again, the pressure increased, the cavitation bubbles collapsed. And so we actually had cavitation failure of a flow line. It does not happen just on pumps. Anywhere where you get an obstruction. Your I and C guys know very well that there can be an issue with cavitation in valves. And that's because you have an obstruction and high velocities, low pressure, vaporization, you go beyond it and then you get failure. Uh, other issues we got, uh, mechanical damage. We're, we're always a little bit concerned when we see a digger coming up on our, our, uh, on our site. And if we get a digger, we've got to make sure that the, the digger is not going to be digging up a buried pipeline. So that's why certainly in the MLPS and so on, then we have, an, if we're digging in that area, on the work permits, it will say something like hand digging only. So definitely an issue. A brittle fracture, low temperature. And I know what you're going to say. You say, we don't operate at low temperatures. Well, just be careful. Because what can happen is if you've got, uh, let's say you have an event where the emergency stop valves are closed, the blow off operates. So now you're depressurizing your pressure vessels. What could happen, particularly if you've got high volatile liquids, like uh, NGLs or even uh, um, LNGs, uh, not so much LNGs, but LPGs. What can happen then if you depressurize, then you get a rapid vaporization. And then we get the Jules-Thompson effect, so temperature can drop. And it's not that unusual to get the temperature dropping below the brittle fracture. So that you need to know what your minimum allowable temperature is on your pressure vessel and your piping, and just make sure that you can't get below that temperature. Uh, MIC is an issue, and it's not just an issue in North America. It's an issue all over the world. Anywhere where you can get sludge forming, <clears throat> you have the potential for bacteria to actually build up underneath that sludge. Now, because the bacteria is living under the sludge, it breathes anaerobically. If it's anaerobically, then that means there is no oxygen. If it's breathing without oxygen, it will exhale something different to what we exhale. And a normal, a normal person, you, me, anyone, as part of our breath exhalation, we will exhale H2O, hydrogen and oxygen. 
But this bacteria does not have access to oxygen, but it may have access to sulfur. So then it actually uses the sulfur in its respiration process. So it exhales H2S. We now get the H2S building up around the bacteria. And what we tend to get is a classic ring or rosetta shape. And that can give us very rapid damage in pressure vessels and piping and even in tank floors can be a big, big issue. There, is, um, there was a, a major event in 2005 in Alaska, and Shell bought out Amoco, and they inherited the Trans-Alaska Pipeline System. And as part of their risk assessment process, they looked at the, they looked at the, the reasons, the causes of potential damage. And one of the things they said was, our pipeline's fairly clean, and we don't need to pig the pipeline because we don't get a lot of debris, we don't get a lot of sludge, so they stopped pigging. About a year after, they had a hole in the pipeline. They lost about 5,000 barrels of crude oil. And this is in Alaska, it's an environmental area, and the big problem there was because it's an environmental area, it's very heavily under government scrutinization, and BP almost lost the lease for all of Alaska, but it cost them a billion dollars. What had happened, because they had stopped the pigging, a little bit of sludge built up on the bottom of the pipe, bacteria started living under the sludge, and the rest is history. So keep your pipelines clean, guys. Uh, the next area we've got there is stress failure and cracking. Um, look at the top there, we've got stress rupture. Now, stress rupture, if you get an overpressure event, um, perhaps because of a control failure or a uh, safety instrumentation system failure, you could get that overpressurization. Usually, if you do have a loss of containment, that's usually because you've also got a problem with wall thinning. So maybe you've got corrosion or erosion. So be careful of your, your control systems, your SIS systems, but most importantly, keep an eye on that wall thickness. Uh, fatigue. Again, you think, nah, fatigue's not an issue for me. Yes, it is. Fatigue is a big, big problem. Fatigue, we all know fatigue is cyclic stress. Okay, if I have something which is being pressurized and unpressurized, pressurized and unpressurized, the stress that's coming from that pressure is now in the form of cycles. So the more cycles I have, the more likely I am to have a failure. So I need to know what the material is. I need to know what the stress levels are. So it's quite easy for us in a batch process. Now, luckily, in PDO, we don't have many batch processes. The thing you guys have to be careful about is vibration. Now, if you've got vibration on a pipe and the pipe starts to move, you've got cyclic stresses. And you probably will end up with a crack at the weld at the far end of the pipe. So watch out for that. The other time where it's an issue is usually in our gas turbines. And if we get a problem with one of the fuel nozzles, so our T5 temperatures are not consistent around the, the nozzle, the nozzles, then we get a variation in temperature, and then we get problems with the blading, saying hot, 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 cold, hot, 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 cold, and eventually the blade will crack. Um, creep, strain aging. The thing about strain aging is it tends to happen mostly with vintage steels. Again, something you have to be careful about because a lot of the PDO infrastructure was built in the 60s and 70s. And so you, you, you do have some old steel. So just keep an eye on this. Any, idea, any areas where you could be prone to cracking, make sure that you include that in your risk assessments. Now the high temperature issue for creep, it's again, not too much of an issue unless you've got fire heaters. Fire heaters and boilers can be susceptible to creep. Now, physical deformation. I remember what we're doing here, guys. We're talking about 
different types of damage mechanisms. Physical deformation and changes, well, right at the top, I've got out of roundness and bulging. Um, typically, this would be manufacturing errors. Uh, dents, you get a new pressure vessel, uh, you get a new section of piping, it falls off the truck, the crane has a failure, you get a dent, can I use it? You get a problem in the, the pipe, a truck is, is driven over the over the, the pipeline, and now you've got a dent in the pipe. So again, this is something I've got to look out for, because if I run an intelligent pig through a pipe that's got a dent in it, that pig's going to get stuck, and that's going to cause me a lot of pain and anguish. Uh, over time, metallurgy is, well, metallurgy can be a problem. Um, as material gets older, we already mentioned strain aging, but you can also have other issues, particularly with fire damage. Now, if you do have a fire, you've got two big problems. If the flames are impinging, usually on a pressure vessel or a pipe, if you have flame impingement and the flame is on there for a long time, you will change the metallurgy. If the flame is on the pipe for a long time and the pipe or the pressure vessel cools down slowly, it will lose hardness, it'll become softer. And that means it's gonna lose strength. So you need to know about that. The other issue we've got is if a firefighter comes along with his fire hose and he sprays this area with cold water, you're quenching the material. By quenching, we're cooling it down too quickly. And that means it's gonna be susceptible to cracking. It has lost toughness. Uh, embrittlement, it's, we're gonna see this on the next slide too. But the main issue I've got with embrittlement is chloride stress corrosion cracking. Now that chloride stress corrosion cracking is a big problem because we do have lots of chlorides, particularly next to the sea. So in Mina Alpha Hal and those areas, then you can have big problems with chlorides and particularly if you're using stainless steel. So if you've got an austenitic stainless steel, something like a 304 or a 316, and you have chlorides in that area, then the chlorides will cause intergranular cracking. We've got stress because of the internal pressure, and that will cause a failure. Very often happens on the weld. So again, it's something else we've got to look out for. Uh, weld misalignments. I remember rebuilding a, a floating roof 50,000 barrel tank in the MLPS in Fahud. And we did have corrosion on the, the shell plates. And so several plates on the bottom course were cut out. We ordered new plates. And when they came, they didn't quite fit. So what we ended up with was instead of the plates meeting like this, there was a slight offset. Now, in the code, the construction code, and for tanks, we use API 650. It gives you a tolerance on how much offset you can have. But for the inspectors, they have to know what that tolerance is. You do not allow any welding to happen if this tolerance is being exceeded. Now, the last slide I've got here about different types of damage mechanisms, it mainly applies to uh, downstream, so mainly refining. Uh, environment assistant cracking I mentioned Stress corrosion cracking particularly, we've got chloride, but remember that also applies to us, not just refinery. Uh, we've got caustic cracking, ammonia, ethanol, and sulfate. Yep. Specifically refining, we have some very specific issues. The other mechanisms I've got there, you should not see this, but high temperature hydrogen attack. Um, there, there was a, a big issue in Tesoro a few years back when there was a high temperature hydrogen attack that caused cracking of a heat exchanger and there were two fatalities. So if you do get moved to that area, just be very cognizant of that, be careful. Same with temperature hydriding. And high temperature corrosion, that's really when we're working with very, very high temperatures. Now, I've talked about a lot of different damage mechanisms. What I would ask you guys to do is make sure that you have a copy of API 571. 
It's not a document that I'm going to sit down and read. It's a reference document. But all of these damage mechanisms that I've discussed and a lot more besides are identified in 571. Please do not be put off by the fact that it says damage mechanisms affecting fixed equipment in the refining industry. This works for us too. All the damage, well, most of the damage mechanisms we see are included in 571. There may be one or two others, but the majority are in here. So we've got a problem. I've got lots and lots and lots of ways in which my equipment can lose integrity. So if I lose integrity, that means I've got a potential for loss of containment. If I've got a loss of containment, my hydrocarbon is going out into the atmosphere. If I'm losing my hydrocarbons, well, eventually it'll find an ignition source. And that's when you have the fire and the explosion. So what we need to do now is to figure out what the possible damage mechanism is. By understanding the damage mechanisms, hopefully I can design most of them out. So the right materials, um, right cathodic protection, right corrosion inhibitors, right thickness of materials, and so on. But there's still the possibility that something could go wrong. So what we need to do is decide what is, my, what is the appropriate technology for inspection. And this is where we have our next problem. Because there's a lot of them. There's a bunch. So how on earth can I decide on what is the right type of inspection for the defect I'm facing? Now, for an example, you might find on a, oh, a separator. So you've got a gas, well, you've got a gas and oil gathering plant. I've got separators in the plant. Um, we've identified there could be pitting around the oily water interface. Um, there's a potential for laminations. Um, I've, I've seen major laminations on the head end of separators. Um, don't worry too much about laminations as long as they're parallel. Remember, we are talking about loss of containment. If the damage mechanism does not affect the integrity of the equipment, don't worry about it. But if it does, you need to decide what is the right inspection technique. Now, what I'm going to talk about over the next few slides, I'm not going to look at every one of these. That would be crazy. We just don't have the time anyway. But I'm going to pick out four inspection technologies or techniques. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say what's good about this technique and what's bad about this technique. So what are the pros and what are the cons? Now, once we know the advantages and the disadvantages, we know its capability, we then say, well, how does that match up with the damage mechanism I'm expecting to see? Now, the one I'm going to look at first is just simple, visual. Well, that's not an inspection technique. Yes, it is. If you have a look in the boiler and pressure vessel code, if you have a look in section five, which is NDE, non-destructive examination, there's a section just for VT, visual test. A good thing about this, relatively easy. In fact, you see a gentleman there looking inside a boroscope, so you can use technology. You can use boroscopes, uh, magnifying glasses, mirrors, a ruler, a pit depth gauge, and so on. Areas where you cannot get in directly, uh, you can use cameras. That's fine, it works, as long as you can actually identify what the problem is. What we do have over here, under the pros, if I can see a defect, I can measure it. That means I can have dimensional accuracy, and it's fairly quick. If you go and look, you do VT on a piece of equipment, you go up to it, well, the first thing is you've got to be able to see it. That means one of your cons is VT can only defect surface macro defects. So it's got to be big enough to see, and you can only see something on the surface. If it's a defect which is inside, like a casting defect or an internal crack, forget it, you can't see it. 
Not only that, the surface must be clean and free of scale. So you have to go, you have to be able to clean it. And that can cause some problems. So the thing about VT, it's quick, it's relatively easy. I can see major problems quite easily, but I'm only seeing problems on the surface. Now, VT is usually required on things like uh, weld inspections. So before you do anything else, you do VT. I go and have a look. I see, is the major undercut? Do I have a lot of weld spatter? Do I see cracks on the surface? These can all be detected with VT. So it's valid. But just remember that some things it's good for, some things it's not good for. So then we go to RT, radiographic test. Well, if we go over to the right-hand side here, the way this works is we start off with some sort of X-ray or gamma ray source. Now that could be an isotope or it could be an electronic source. This is gonna send X-ray or gamma ray down through our test piece. Now over at this area, there is no metal layer. So on the other side of my test piece, I have X-ray film, I've got a digital receiver, and that means if I've got no metal, lots and lots of x-rays go into the film. So that becomes very dark. Now I've got an area where I have a small amount of metal compared to a, a heavy amount of metal. The heavy amount of metal will let fewer x-rays through. So that becomes lighter than the thin area. If I've got a defect inside, there's less metal. That less metal means more x-rays go through. I get a darker area. This gives me my very first pro. It's dimensionally accurate. So I can actually measure the size of a defect. Not only that, it goes right the way through the test piece. Unlike VT, where I could only measure the surface, RT goes right through. Brilliant. But then we have another issue. <clears throat> Let's say I've got something like this, like uh, maybe slag inclusions. So we've had a, some stick welding done, so shielded metal arc welding. We've done a root weld. Then after the root weld, the welder has gone and done his hot pass, his fill pass, and so on. But he's not cleaned out the slag properly after the previous run. So some of the slag has been left in there. And what we end up are these little dark areas. Now, I don't know about you guys, and I am not a qualified inspector for RT, and I find this quite difficult. This looks quite easy in this picture, but this is a classic example. They're not always easy. So what we've got is the pros mean it's potentially accurate. On the cons, you need expertise. You might also need quite a bit of time. Now, if you're using old style film, that means once you've done the x-ray, the film must be taken away and developed. If we're lucky, we've got our, our x-ray guys have the capacity to develop the film on site. Otherwise, it will have to go away somewhere else to be developed. Then it has to come back and then it has to be evaluated. So it, does, it can take time. But the big issue here is safety. X-rays and gamma rays, not only will they go through the steel, they'll also go through your skin, the muscles, and it will go into your, your body. You get more and more X-rays going into your body. These X-rays can affect your DNA. And effectively what it'll do, it will chop up the individual strands of the DNA chain. So then as your skin wears and your your body is developing new skin cells. Instead of getting a nice new skin cell, what you get is a cancer. So we've got to be very, very careful that we don't overload anyone in that area with too much x-rays. Now, we, what you'll probably see is the x-ray guys, the bombers, when they're going on site, they've got a little blue badge, and that little blue badge has an x-ray film, and every so often that will be developed so we can actually check to see just how much x-rays these guys have absorbed. If it's too much, they go off-site. 
don't let them have too much. For our operators, they don't wear that badge. That means the operators must be excluded from the area where the x-rays are taking place. And of course, a lot of our operators don't like that. Okay, so the next thing we've got is UT. If we got UT, then UT is ultrasonic testing. Ultrasonic testing is wonderful. It's the mainstay of most inspection regimes. So right at the top, it's dimensionally accurate. Yes, it is. In fact, you know, the one thing I'm not saying on here that I probably should say is it's safe. Ultrasonic testing is safe, not like RT. But let, before we actually go through the pros and cons, let's have a look at how it works. And the thing is, We've got three different types. I've got pulse echo, P-E-U-T. And with the pulse echo technique, I've got my transducer on the steel. It sends a pulse of high frequency sound into the steel. It echoes, reflects off the back wall, goes back to the transducer. Now what I see now on a time domain scale here, so this is milliseconds or microseconds, this now is my initial pulse. A certain amount of time later, I see the reflection goes back to the sensor. Now, if I know the speed of sound in steel, which I do, I know the time it takes to get the reflection back, I can easily calculate the wall thickness. So that's good. What we will have to do though, is make sure we put a coupling fluid between the transducer and the steel just so we, could, we don't have too much attenuation of the signal. If you do have a major defect in the steel, it's quite possible you might see this. Now, this example would be classical for, say, a lamination. So you would see that. And that would show up as a reflection at a different time period. So this is really good for getting wall thickness. It's okay for major defects in the steel, but for small cracks, pitting, it's not the best. So what I could do, <clears throat> I could go to my next phase, which is phased array. What I now know, have are multiple sensors. My multiple sensors now are all aligned up. And what we'll do is we'll send signals down into the steel. We'll get the reflections coming back and because I've got multiple sensors, and I can also move this around or I can steer it, what I can end up with is enough data to actually build up an image. So now I can get a pretty good picture of actually what's happening inside my steel. And this is, it's not uncommon to use this uh, to check wells. Not only that, I said it was safe. This is a picture of one of my grandsons. And when my daughter-in-law went to the hospital to get a scan, they used phased array, and there he is. He still has a big head. <laughs> no, it's a normal size head. But the thing is, it's safe, because I would not have allowed my daughter-in-law to go and have this done if it was, it was X-ray. That would be very, very different. Now, there are some issues with this. With phased array, if I've got a defect which is in line with the, the ultrasound waves, it might not see it. So it can miss some defects. So it can miss particularly some cracks. Now, over the years, we actually went a stage further and we went to look at time of flight. This is very similar to phased array, but instead of reflection, it uses diffraction. And now I've got two sensors. And as the signal goes around, it reaches an area of change of density. It diffracts the signal. Now, again, we get enough information. This builds up inside the computer, and we get a pretty good picture. And in fact, if we go further in this, this is a time of flight picture of my other grandson. Well, one of my other grandsons. And you see the picture on this is very clear. Now, a lot of time when we say time of flight, what we've actually done is we've combined 
the diffraction technique and the reflection technique. But it's very, very useful. Now, if we look at the pros, it's dimensionally accurate, 100% penetration, just like RT, results are immediate because you're using a computer on site. With phased array UT, I don't necessarily have to move the sensor a lot. I can actually steer the beam electronically. Time of flight has got very good defect detection. The defects, sorry, the cons, I do have to have access to the surface. That means if you've got insulation on the surface, the insulation must be removed. Uh, pulse echo is not good for defect detection, but it is good for calculating wall thickness. Phased array UT, difficult to detect cracks which are lined up with the waves. Time of flight does have dead zones. In fact, you can see an idea of these zones in this image over here. But a good technique, in fact, some of the modern machines now are combining both of these, and that's very good. So what we've got is it's a very good technique. Uh, one con I've not actually mentioned, if you do have a combination of phased array and time of flight, they're expensive. Now you think about it, only 10 years ago, a hospital would have something like this that would cost them $3 million. The price has come way down now, but we're still talking many, many thousands. But it's, the price has come, has come down a lot, and you're seeing a lot of contractors now are using this. And just the last one that, on this, sec, this part of this section is magnetic techniques. Now, magnetic, um, two main types for us. One is MPI. And with, its, with MPI, I can use pro, prod or I could use yoke. Um, this is a, a yoke, and this is electromagnets. So now, the lines of flux are traveling through the steel. If there's a defect like this, the lines of flux are trying to bridge the defect. So now we spray on metallic particles, which are, well, they're made usually of some type of iron. So at least if they, they can catch the magnetic field, the lines of flux. So the point is these little filings, they will cluster around the defect. Now this is usually used quite a lot for welds to detect cracks, it's pretty good. There is another technique which is called MFL, which is very similar, but instead of using metallic particles, I use a sensor. This is like a Hall effect sensor. This measures magnetic field. Now, with something like this, I could use this in an intelligent pig, which I could send down a pipe. This is sending signals out. It's collecting the information back in again. It knows where it is. It means it can, it can collect a lot of data over a long distance. It can store that data and it can feed it back to you. If I'm doing a tank floor inspection, I'll probably also use MFL. It's the modern way of doing things. The pros, quick to deploy, it's safe, it's magnetism. MPI is good for well checks, MFL good for pipeline and tank floor corrosion pitting. The cons, I can only use this on ferromagnetic materials. Won't work on plastic, won't work on brass, will not work on aluminium, will not work on some stainless steels. Uh, the depth of the effect is limited, and particularly for MPI you'll only see defects which are at or very close to the surface. Now, MFL also has a couple of other issues. It's sensitive to plate thickness, so it means you've got to have the right type of sensor depending on the, the plate thickness. So particularly important on intelligent pigging and for floor plates. And it does not differentiate if you've got pitting on the inside or the outside. So what we've done is we've looked at four different techniques, and of course we know there are many of them. We've identified there are some good things about them, but there are some shortcomings. So what you need to do is to identify what these things are good at, what the inspection techniques are good at, what they're not good at. You now marry that with the defects you're expecting to see in your pipe, your vessel, your tank, and then you match them together. 
you'll find that some of them are not that good. Even the best is not that good. So what you might need to do is use more than one technique. And we often do this. So if you have more than one inspection technique, you're increasing the reliability of the measurement. You're increasing the probability that you will see a defect if it exists. So what's all this got to do to the asset integrity management? Well, we've been talking about technical integrity or mechanical integrity of equipment in the pressure envelope. Now, a lot of our equipment, because we're working in oil and gas, our equipment is designed to code. And if you look over on the right-hand side here, if we say our equipment is designed to code, if it's a pressure vessel, oil and pressure vessel code section 8, piping, B31, 31.4 for oil lines, B31.8 for gas lines, 31.3 within the barrier. Um, if it's tanks, it'll be API 650. So what we're doing is we're building our equipment according to a recognized code. And that gets rid of most of the problems because the codes have developed as these loss of containments have happened. And we realize where the shortcomings are, we reflect that in the code, we make it better. Now what we also do on top of that, we have an inspection code. So API 510, 576, 53. So these are tuned to the type of equipment we're using it with. Now, if we take the inspection code and we marry that with what we expect to see, what we now have is a fairly powerful technique. To go even further, if, if I try to assess the risk associated with each of these damage mechanisms, with each of these inspection types, with each of these different types of equipment, that will help me fine tune my inspection plan. So say for example, I've got a potable water tank right next door to a gas header which has got a lot of H2S. Now, according to the traditional inspection codes, they would be inspected at more or less the same interval. Because it only is, these codes are only concerned with the damage mechanism itself, not with the consequences. If I now take a risk-based inspection methodology, I can now identify what are the implications if this loss of containment occurs. What it means is I'm going to spend a lot more time inspecting that H2S header than that potable water tank. If you do find a defect, I can do a fitness for service standard. Now, if you take all of this together, all of this stuff, you now have the beginnings of an asset integrity program. It's only the mechanical side of things, only the physical aspect. You still have to look at other things. Now, Andy Gibbons will be looking at this on Wednesday, the other, the other issues. Now, API and the SME have not really developed an asset integrity program, except fairly recently, they've published uh, bulletins and recommended practices for pipeline. And what they've also done very specifically for offshore, and this is very recent, they've started to publish asset integrity management, AIM for moorings, for risers, and for floating systems. So watch this space. This will start to come out over the next few years for other types of equipment. But the main thing is, I want to get back into this thing about risk. How can I use a risk to figure out what I should be doing with my inspection plan. <clears throat> right, this red line here, this is meant to be a process parameter. If my process parameter stays under control, life is good, I don't have to worry. If it goes out of what I consider to be good control, what I might have is a process shutdown. That means an alarm goes off in the control room, an operator shuts down that part of the plant or he makes a change. If the operator cannot do that, we end up with an emergency shutdown. This is automatic. This is where your safety instrumentation system takes over. If that doesn't help, if we go even further, 
we now start to rely on our relief valves. We're now starting to rely on some sort of pressure restricting device. If that doesn't work, I get loss of containment. That's a gas leak, a hydrocarbon leak. At the moment, it has not caught fire, but if it finds an ignition source, then I get a fire or an explosion, maybe even a toxic release. If this carries on even further, so now the fire gets out of control, we're now into a catastrophe. We're now into community response. Now, what we are doing, we are looking at our equipment and we are trying to make sure that we stay certainly within that area. We want to be below that line. That line represents a loss of containment. We want to make sure our equipment is in good enough condition that it should stay in this area in process control. So the our controls are design to code, commissioning, inspection, and maintenance. And it's that inspection and maintenance I'm most interested in. But when I'm doing my risk assessment, I will also look at this area. I will say, well, how likely is it that we're going to get a loss of containment? Now, if I know the probability of a failure, I can marry that with the time it takes to get to that failure. If I know how long it takes to get to that failure, what I can now do is do my inspection before that happens. I really need to know how that works. I also need to know if there is a loss of containment, what are the potential consequences? And at this risk assessment stage, what I can now do, I can look at these consequences and I can put mitigations in place like gas detection and maybe evacuation plans and so on. Now, the inspection codes, they do tell us who has to do what. Our inspector is not necessarily the person who goes out and takes the measurements, but the inspector is responsible for collating the measurements and ensuring our equipment is in good condition. Our engineer, our piping engineer, our pressure vessel engineer, our tank engineer, he's responsible to make sure that the engineering review is carried out. We can do a good analysis. So he may well be working with the inspector to carry out a fitness for service assessment. The repair organization is who actually does the work. It could be the company itself, more likely it's gonna be a contractor. And don't forget everyone else, everyone who understands what's going on here. Now what RBI is, it's likelihood multiplied by consequence. Now over here, I've got the API 581 risk matrix, probability and consequence, and I've got four levels of risk. I really, really do not want my equipment to be in the high risk category. Now, you may have seen something different because Shell uses a risk matrix, something like this. It's very similar, even though it's laid out differently, in that you've still got consequence against probability. And there are different types of consequence, people, assets, environment, reputation. Uh, API does something similar too. So I, the point of that is I really don't care which system you use as long as you do use the system. Now, once you've decided that you're going to do risk-based inspection, set up your team. Now, when you set up your team, don't worry too much about how many people are on the team. You now think about capability of the team. I need someone who understands the inspections. I need someone who understands repairs. I need someone who understands the process. I need somebody who understands the effect of an explosion or a fire. Now, that means your safety guy is probably going to be a chemical engineer. Now, once you've got your team set up, the team now looks at the equipment. The first thing it does, it says, how can I group my equipment for inspections? So if I'm going to shut down a part of the plant, then all of the equipment in that plant is one group. I then look at all of the damage mechanisms I do a risk-based prioritization based on probability and on consequence. At this stage, if the consequences are unacceptable, I'll put mitigations in place. I now take my inspection techniques. I've now considered my probabilities. I've now developed my plan. I give that to the inspectors or the examiners. The plan is not only the type of inspection, it's also making sure everything's ready. 
So making sure that there's scaffolding, there's a crane, there's it's a safe isolation. So once the inspection is carried out, we analyze the results and we update the program. The next stage here, if you find anything that is not expected, that means your risk prioritization was not correct. That's okay, because this will develop and get better as time goes on. And that will feed back into the plan and now you have a closed loop. It never finishes. It keeps going and going and going. Now, how often do you take the readings depends on the corrosion rate. Now, if we take readings on, let's say, a separator, we know the nominal thickness, we take several readings, this is my long-term corrosion rate. That means from that last reading to when that rate crosses my T minimum, minimum wall thickness acceptable, is that my remaining life? Well, be careful because look at this. That's your short-term corrosion rate. You need to work on the worst corrosion rate and you must inspect at no more than half the remaining life. And what you should end up with is a document, several pages long, and that is, be, that is going to be your RBI document. So this is going to have things like, how do I isolate? Uh, what scaffolding do I need? What resources do I need? How many people are going to be involved? What sort of inspections am I going to do? Where am I going to do the inspections? How am I going to get it cleaned? How am I going to get it safe for entry? Everything in there is in that RBI document. That is given to the inspector and the inspector directs the examiners. If you do that right, you shouldn't have a loss of containment. Wow, I think I'm starting to lose my voice, guys. So, what can we do? Use proper code for construction, design, and commissioning. Use RBI for your inspection program. Use the API codes and the DEPs for guidance. Use your fitness for service to quantify the extent of the damage. Inspect, 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 record, record, record. And don't forget, you won't get it right the first time. Nobody does. Nobody gets it 100% correct. So when your inspector goes in and realizes you haven't picked up everything, make sure you include that in your plan. So the endpoints, the physical causes, loss of containment, what can I do to prevent the fires and explosions? Inspect, don't forget to do the repairs. And that means if your inspector says, I need to shut this piece of equipment down, talk about it for sure, but really take it seriously. Do not just keep extending the life of this piece of equipment on paper, because sometime it'll bite you. To decide on the right technologies, identify the pros and cons. Don't be frightened of using more than one technology. Whew. I'm sorry, guys, that's a, a lot of stuff. There's a lot of material, and I did run quickly, and we did just about an hour. And I'm okay. sure, sure there are some questions, Andy. Thanks, thanks, Ron. Just to remind everyone, if you do have more questions, then please drop them into the, the chat box so that we can pick those up and, and answer those. So please get, get firing away now. Um, one, Ron, in, uh, in terms of your own experiences in Oman and with, with PDO, yeah. what were the most common issues that, that you came across in your time? What are the kind of things that people should be looking out for? Oh, it really depends on the equipment. Um, when I was brought in, my very first job was to look at the, um, the storage tanks because about 50% of the storage tanks had rotten floors. And some of the, um, the aquifers were actually being contaminated by crude oil. So the bottom part of the storage tank is something I'm very, very wary of. There will be corrosion there. Uh, we make sure that you've got your cathodic protection working and make sure the coatings are in good condition. So anytime that the tank is opened up for, say, sludge removal, 
let the inspector get in there, do an inspection. Uh, other points on pressure vessels, the, the biggest problem we had was pitting on the oily water interface. There were some of the minor issues, but that was the big one. Um, piping, we, we didn't have too much of a problem with piping apart from um, external pitting. That usually was in areas where either coating was damaged or the, or the, the IP had failed, cathodic protection. So there are issues in all of them, but they're the main issues that, that uh, I came up against. Okay, thank, thanks, Ron. Another one, um, Shell, and obviously PDO has got a lot of historical linkage into, into Shell, yeah. always had the, the reliability-centered maintenance approach, or the SRCM. What's the linkage between SRCM and, and RBI? It's essentially the same thing. The only difference is time. Um, if I'm using reliability, which is mainly for rotating equipment, so an RCM type of technique, I'm still saying what could go wrong. But the, the difference here is that when I'm looking at static equipment, I'm mainly looking at damage mechanisms. So I'm looking at uh, corrosion, pitting, cracking, and so on. When I'm looking at reliability of rotating equipment, there are many, many more types of damage mechanisms. So it's, if you take a simple case like a pump, um, you could have the, the normal, site of dam normal type of damage we can expect, which is um, bearings, wear rings. That's what tends to go mechanical seal, don't forget. Um, so what we do is historically, we'd look at those types of failures and we do an analysis. And again, we do, we do a risk assessment and it depends on how likely that failure is and what are the consequences. So say for example, if it's a water injection pump and you've got eight water injection pumps operating together, one of them goes down, the consequences aren't usually too bad. But if you've got a, a mainline pump and you've already got one down for routine maintenance, then you could be talking about uh, a potential um, deferral of production. That could be big. So what, what I would do is I would identify what the probabilities of failure are, and I would really do something fancy like um, the Weibull analysis. People get frightened with Weibull analysis, but honestly, it's really easy. <laughs> so I would do that. Um, and then what they'll do, a good Weibull analysis would tell me when I can expect to have my defects, statistically. So then I would do either my change out or my inspection program, maybe a vibration, to actually detect the problem before it becomes a failure. So essentially, they're the same thing. With RBI for static plant, I'm identifying what could go wrong, and then I'm using inspection techniques to detect that failure before it happens. With RCM, I'm saying what could go wrong, and I'm using different inspection techniques or maintenance techniques to either identify it or fix it before it becomes a major failure. So there's a great deal of symmetry there. Okay, thanks, thanks, Ron. I, I don't have any more questions coming from the group. Is anyone uh, feeling shy but wants to, to ask a question? Please feel free. Now is the, the chance to do that. Oh, I am. Um, I see one. How to do inspection in buried lines in plants? <laughs> oh dear me! You come up with some doozies, do you, Ahmed? <laughs> <laughs> It's tough. That is really, really difficult. Um, if we're talking about process, uh, process pipe, um, it's, it's going to be very difficult. In fact, the only way you can do something like that is, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm expecting you've got some sort of CP, some sort of cathodic protection. So you'd be checking your cathodic protection voltages once a month. Uh, that's going to be your primary line of defense. If you don't have any sort of CP, then you're going to have to do something else, and that means having inspection pits. So we'd have an inspection pit in certain locations, and you go down and check it out. Um, 
uh, you know, a lot of companies have said there are some really good techniques for detecting leaks, um, and even some good techniques for detecting um, corrosion in buried pipe. And if you can't get a pig down it, in my experience, it doesn't work. So I'm sorry, it's tough. Um, so there, there are your options. Do your CP first. If you don't have CP, um, in fact, even if you do, you probably will have to dig some inspection pits. I'm sorry, that's a lot of work. But if you come up with a technique that can do this effectively, let me know, and I'll guarantee we'll be on the stock exchange within 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> Ron, there's a question from Zainab as well. I, I can't see the question here, but I think it's sent to, to you. Um, don't see it. No, it's just flagging up in the in the participant list. But oh, Zainab, Zainab, Zainab was complaining about um, couldn't hear the audio. Right. Okay. That's probably all it was. Okay. Any any further questions, anybody? Please shout up now, or we can we can look to to wrap up there. Ron, you can maybe say a little bit about the the Petra Skills courses that uh, link to this subject. Yeah, th this is the shameless advertising. So <laughs> we do, we do have courses. If you wanted to know anything more in detail about the topics we've covered, ME forty one for piping systems. Um, ME43 for pressure vessels, uh, PF22, that's an excellent corrosion course, it's done by Carlos Palacios, HS45, which Andy does, and PS4, which who does that, Andy? That's also me. <laughs> uh, we also have the online training, which is basics of static mechanical and process safety engineering principles. They are online courses. These courses are instructor-led. It, traditionally, they would have been face-to-face. -face. We are now offering all of these virtually. So it is still instructor-led, but online in a similar manner to this, but with interaction. We don't mute people on, the, on an instructor-led. Uh, our Tech Tuesday, which Andy mentioned, uh, tomorrow, Kevin Kyler is one of our subsurface guys, and he's gonna do a, a webinar on how to read a MUD report. What does it tell you? For me, that's total magic. I have no idea. The week after, on 16th of June, how to avoid surprises during a turnaround and deliver your brownfield project successfully. Now, for a lot of your maintenance guys and your operations guys, I think that would be very interesting. Certainly, I'll be listening in on that one. And that's about it for the time being. We do have a lot more. It will be every Tuesday. Um, there will be a different topic. The The webinar is recorded. So even if the timing does not work for you, what you could do is you could just log in to the Petroskills website. And then what you could do, uh, you could download the recorded session. And our our main aim is to help you. Okay, guys. So thank, thanks again, everyone. Uh, Ron and I are regularly in uh, Muscat, and we regularly come to, to visit PDO. So we hope, uh, inshallah, we'll, uh, we'll see you all there one day soon, once this, this COVID has uh, finally gone away. Thank you all very much. Inshallah. Thank you. And thank you for the kind words and the messages. Okay, now I think I need another cup of coffee. <laughs> okay, Nandi, I think I'm going to I'll sign off now. Cup of coffee, Ron. <laughs> okay, then. Okay. Right, I'm going to I'm going to sign out. Okay.